Hey! How's it going, church? You guys good? It sounds like it. It sounds like it. I'm assuming we all did that song at all the campuses, Blessed Assurance. Who is thankful today for the assurance of the gospel and how much God loves us and has secured us and saved us? So glad you are here. Welcome to the Durham campus. Welcome to the Garner campus, Sanford campus, Hillsborough campus, Kenya campus, online campus. Come on. We are one church in many locations. Welcome to all of you folks. So uh, we're in this series, if, if you're new today, um, my name is Benji, I'm one of the pastors here. We're in this series called Mindset. And uh, what we've been saying in this series, and it really is uh, true, is that your mind is a battlefield. Everybody say battlefield. I know Pat Benatar said love is a battlefield, but your mind is a battlefield. Filled. And I was going to review today because we're like, we're in our fourth week. I might review next week or whatever, but I, I just don't have time to review. If you've missed any of the messages, go to our YouTube channel and you can check them all out there. I just want to really, really, really encourage you because this series is building and I'm telling you, it is a game changer. Have you ever really thought about this? Check this out. The life that we have right now is in so many different aspects, a result of the thoughts we have been thinking up to today. I mean, that's, that is a sobering thought, if you will, right? The life you're living right now is a result of the thoughts that you've been thinking many, many years building up to this. And check this out. I saw somebody taking a picture, so I'm gonna pause just ever so quickly so they can get that picture in. Check this out. Here's the next slide. The life we will have one year from now five years from now, 10, or even 50 years from now will be in many different aspects a result of the thoughts we will think between right now and then. That's how important this series is. And that's how important it is that we start to understand the mind I will do this. I will do this by way of review. The very first week, I told you the resources that I'm using. I know some of you missed that. Let me go and throw those back up there because I think now some of you are so into this that maybe you're actually ready to read some on the side. Get Out of Your Head by Jenny Allen. Man, some of you women are using this book in your life groups. Great book, but men, it's not just a book for women. It's a great book, Get Out of Your Head. I started getting more and more into this book this past week, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table by Louis Giglio. Unbelievable book. I, I, I lean on Louis Giglio. I love his stuff. Winning the War in Your Mind by Craig Groeschel. Big Craig Groeschel fan, love his stuff, use his stuff. Winning the War in Your Mind. Here's one by Dr. Caroline Leaf, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. And then mindset. Now, mindset's a thick, thick book. Let me tell you, it's a thick one and it's, it's nuanced and heavy. The New Psychology of Success. There's some books if you wanna do some reading on the side. Now, we've been, we've been anchoring this entire series in this particular passage of scripture from 2 Corinthians 10, three through five. Why don't we read it out loud together? You guys wanna read some word together? Let's read the word together today. Ready, go. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Then Paul says this, on the contrary, they have divine power to do what, church? Demolish. To demolish strongholds. Everybody say demolish. If you're online, just type that into the chat. Demolish. What do we demolish? Strongholds. I'll get to that in just a moment. We demolish, verse five, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we what? We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Everybody shout, take captive. Yeah. What we're learning to do is we're learning to demolish pretensions and arguments and strongholds, and we're learning to take captive our thought life so that it is obedient to Christ. Now here's what a stronghold is. It is a wrong or unfaithful pattern of thinking. If you're a note taker, write that down. If you're not a note taker, you guys know me too well. 
It's a wrong or unfaithful pattern of thinking. Now, I wonder today, I wonder how many of you would admit to me today that you have a fairly decent life. You you feel like you're doing pretty good. Life's good. Praise be to God. 2020 is in the past. Can I get an amen? And we're all feeling kind of good, right? But how many of you would also admit that even though you have a pretty decent life, you complain a lot? Ooh, Sister in the back is testifying to me. Thank God for honesty in the house of the Lord. You, you, you know you got it pretty good, but the truth is you've kind of you've started to become a complainer. Or heck, maybe you've been a complainer your entire life. Now, the mind is a very complex organ, and God created it, and so it is incredibly powerful. I believe it's the most powerful organ in our body. And if you lean into the science and the study of the human brain, you start to realize how complex it is. And in the brain, we have what scientists now call neural pathways. Neural pathways are, it's just like what it sounds. It's pathways that as you start to live your life and you start to develop some strongholds, some unhealthy patterns based upon past experiences or whatever the case may be, your brain literally creates these pathways in your brain so that when circumstances arise, you tend to think a certain way by default. By default. And the more you live into that, the more you start to think out of habit, as opposed to demolishing strongholds. Here, here's a picture. Any, any of you people go in the woods? You guys ever go in the woods? Can I just encourage you to go in the woods from time to time? Woods are great. It's a path. It's a path. And if you were to walk into these woods, how many of you would take off to the right or the left? No. You would, you would do what? You would walk right down the pathway. Now, if you did take off to the right or left and you kept walking there and someone put a chain up where nobody could walk down the pathway, what would happen in time? The path would grow up and you would develop another pathway. That is what this series is teaching us how to do. And so what I wanna introduce to you today is a scientific concept, a, a neurological concept called cognitive bias. What am I talking about? Cognitive bias bias. We all have them. Raise your hand if you have cognitive biases. I should see every hand in the house of the Lord go up. We all have them. A cognitive bias is a mistake in reasoning or an unhealthy pattern of thinking that is based on personal experiences or past past preferences. You might also call this a mental filter, right? We all have filters. You might also call this a mental framework. What we're talking about is cognitive biases. Here's, here's an example. Maybe I'll give a few examples. You, you might have grown up, some of you, you might have grown up and you were around abusive men. Maybe, maybe your dad was an abusive man, Because of that experience, you developed a cognitive bias and you therefore, if you are not careful and you don't learn to create new neural pathways, you will then start to assume that all men are abusive, right? The worst case scenario in this is when someone has a bad experience with their father and then they start to get introduced to Christianity and people then start referring to God as heavenly father, the cognitive bias that they live with is they have a hard time disassociating their theological understanding of God, separating it from their understanding of their earthly father. Another example, maybe you grew up, and this would be a lot of us, you grew up in a home where your parents were racist. And so as a result, you saw patterns in them that uh, treated people of different skin color poorly and sinfully. And as a result, you developed a cognitive bias whereby you now look down on people who have different skin color than you. A, that's a sin. B, you have to learn to overcome it and demolish that stronghold. Are you guys picking up what I'm laying down? It's really, really prevalent everywhere. Now, 
changing the filter changes the fill. What you want to do is you want to learn, and this is what this series is teaching us, how to actually change your cognitive bias or your mental filter. How many of you, like when you post pictures on social media, you'll, post a, you'll, you'll take a picture, and then you look at it before you get ready to post it, but you're like, that picture doesn't look that good. So what do you do, right? What do you do? You put a filter on that bad boy. I just wanna say thanks be to God. I think more and more people are doing that less and less because we're actually coming to terms with the fact that, hey, none of us are perfect. All of our images aren't perfect. Everybody knows you're not perfect. We all have junk in our trunk, so quit trying to hide it. (laughs) But if you change the filter, it changes the feel. It changes the feel. So this cognitive bias might be also referred to as a default filter a default filter. It's why two people can experience the very same thing and have completely different responses. I've seen this in ministry before. If you're a leader in the corporate world, you know this. You can walk in and have a meeting with one person and you can give them a constructive evaluation, performance review, and you can try to coach them and you can try to help them. Hey, here are some growth areas for you. Here are some blind spots for you. Here are some things you need to work on. And one person can just go, how dare you come at me with that? I've been here eight years. Do you know the value I bring to this organization? Who do you think you are? You can walk right down the hallway and give a very similar review or evaluation to another person and their response, thank you so much for caring about me, enough to pour into me and develop me. I am so thankful that I work for someone who cares and wants to help me grow as a leader. What's going on there? It's a mental cognitive bias or a default filter. Another example, it's why two people can come to the same exact church and they can bust up in there And within 10 minutes of the worship celebration, they can be like, I don't like those people on stage. They're phony. I bet they're all getting paid. By the way, they're all volunteers. I bet they're all getting paid. And I don't like that pastor. Who does he think he is? I don't like this church. I didn't like the people in the parking lot. I'm out of here. And on the very next row, Somebody can bust up in here and go, I absolutely love the worship leader and all of the musicians and the preacher. He's kind of cool. And I like the people coming in. I love this church. (laughs) What's going on? It's cognitive bias manifesting itself in a default filter that we all have. We all have these. Biblical example. Read this story later. I'm not going to get into it much now, but Numbers 13 and 14. In Numbers 13 and 14, there's these two guys that uh, I named, we named our last two uh, kids over, Joshua and Caleb. And in Numbers 13 and 14, remember they send the spies into the land and uh, they send 12 in, 10 come back. And 10 come back and they look at their enemies as giants. And they're like, there's no way we can defeat these giants. And in fact, the land will swallow us up, which is a funny concept when you think about it. The land is going to swallow us up. And they come back all negative and two dudes, Joshua and Caleb, come back and they're like, Most, we can take them, we can beat them, we can whip them, we got this, let's roll. Now, Side note, I think one point in the passage is that there are a lot more people that you will encounter who are afraid and negative than faith-filled and positive. Point number one. But point number two, what was the difference between Caleb and Joshua and all the other spies? It was this default filter. Now, a filter, another way of looking at this, and I've actually done some work in therapy with this, not me being the counselor, but but me being counseled. Uh, Yes, I have been to therapy and not ashamed of it at all. Um, Another way to look at this is reframing a subject, reframing a circumstance. And so if you look at this picture up here, you, you all see the beauty of it, but really it all depends on how you frame the picture. See, imagine you wake up tomorrow and again, like I asked you earlier on, how many of you think you have a pretty good life but the truth is you complain. You're, you're kind of a negative Eeyore, sky is falling kind of person. It's okay, you're amongst friends, we love you. 
but it all depends on how you frame it. If you get up tomorrow and here's your thought, you know, today's gonna be a really hard day and I didn't sleep well. And besides that, I, I've gotta go to work with people that I really don't enjoy. Besides that, my car stinks and I don't know if the old clunker is even gonna get me to the office. And then when I get there, I got all these meetings with these people that I don't like and then I'm gonna work too hard and I got all these projects that I'll never get done. How do you think your day is going to turn out? Pretty bad. However, if you wake up tomorrow, and this is what some of us need to start doing, this is how you create a new neural pathway. Instead of being down here, framing it in the darkness of the day, what if instead you said, you know what? Hey, today is a great day. Today is a great, this is the day that the Lord has made, what? Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And you know what, God? I'm thankful that last night I had a roof over my head and a bed to sleep in. And God, I thank you so much that downstairs or wherever in the refrigerator, I've got some breakfast and some coffee. And if I don't, God, I thank you that I can bust up in McDonald's and buy like two biscuits for 99 cents. And God, I know my car's a clunker, but you know what, Lord? I'm thankful that I have a clunker that will get me to work. By the way, nobody cares what kind of car you drive anyway. Right, right? And I'm glad, God, that I get to go to work. You know, there are people who don't even have a job. God, I'm thankful I got a job. And God, even though those people kind of get on my last nerve sometimes, you know what? I'm gonna choose to frame it and believe the best about them. And I'm thankful that I can have some meetings. And God, I'm thankful that my supervisors have invested in me enough to feel like they can give me big projects to work on. <laughs> What's the difference? It's all about how you frame it. And that is what I wanna spend the rest of my time talking to you about today. It is about reframing. Again, if you're a note taker, take a picture of this or jot this down at all of our campuses or for those of you who are online. Reframing, here's a working definition. It's creating a different way of looking at a situation or relationship by changing its meaning. Like, Depending on how you frame things, you determine the meaning of things. Your mind has the potential and the power to do that. Not the reality of things, but the meaning of things. It's looking at a situation or a relationship and changing its meaning. Hey, I know that we can't control what happens to us. You can't control what happens to you. But the good news is that you can control how you frame it. And once you learn to start framing things the right way and you start developing a different default filter, a different cognitive bias, a different frame by which you look at things, that is what the word of the Lord means when we say we can demolish strongholds and we can take captive and obedient our thoughts to Christ. Very, very important. So if you look at the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, and by the way, this, is, this series really is grounded in the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote Corinthians. We've been looking at 2 Corinthians 10. In Philippians, Paul is, is in a very unfortunate situation. I love the Apostle Paul because uh, he didn't live the perfect life. He was, a, he was not a Christian his whole life. He... Um, he was a persecutor of the church and Christians saw he, he had a conversion, he became Paul. And when Paul got on fire for Christ, he really got on fire for Christ. And Paul wanted to get to Rome. One of Paul's ultimate desires was to get to Rome so that he could preach the gospel. Because in Rome, they had these Romans roads that went out to all of first century Palestine and the Middle Eastern world. And Paul knew, hey, if I can just get to Rome, I can preach this gospel and it can spread. Unfortunately, they didn't have multi-site back then. Paul couldn't just say, hey, I'm gonna shoot this message and you put it on video and send it to the campuses. Paul, Paul, Paul just said, I got to get to Rome. And guess what? He got to Rome. But guess how he got to Rome? In prison. Not what he had in mind. 
Remember, you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. So Paul is in jail. He has every reason to be negative. And I wanna read to you the NWV translation. It's called the New Winers Version. And Paul, Paul in Philippians 1, 12 and 13, here's, here's, here's the new Winer's version. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me really sucks. <laughs> As a result of all the hell I've been through, I'm quitting life group and never going back to church. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, for those of you who are new to church, listen, there is no such thing. <laughs> There is no such thing as the NWV, the New Winer's Version. I, I created that. Some of you are like, oh, I gotta find, that's my favorite translation. <laughs> Where has this church been my whole life? <laughs> that's not in the Bible, okay? Instead of whining, and some of us are whiners. This is what the Bible really says. He said, now what I want you to know, brothers and sisters, is that what has happened to me has actually served, <laughs> hello, to advance the gospel. See, New Winer's version lives on the lower story of life. When, when I'm talking to you today about that, this is not even in my notes, but it's just coming to you right now. It's interesting that in this portrait, all of this is dark. This is the lower story of life. Some of you are living on the lower story. God doesn't want you to live the lower story. He wants you to come up to the upper story. And Paul says, I want you to know that, that what has happened to me has, has helped me advance the gospel. Go ahead and throw that back up there. Look at what he says here. As a result, it has become clear that throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am what? A prisoner and life is miserable? No, I am what? In chains for Christ. Look at what he says here. Powerful, powerful teaching from the word of the Lord. It's all about how you frame it. And then you go down a little bit further and in verse 14, he says this. Why don't we read this one out loud together, church? Ready, go. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. What's he doing? He's framing or he's reframing his existence. Whereas he could see himself as the prisoner, guess what? About every six to eight hours, they would bring in another prison guard to watch over Paul. Paul's like, I'm not the prisoner. The guard's the prisoner and he's gonna hear the gospel for eight hours straight, baby. <laughs> Come on now. And he's preaching it, he's slinging it and bringing it. And then other people see his faith and his confidence and the gospel starts spreading. You see what I mean when I say this? This is game changing kind of stuff for us. If we will lock in and let the word of the Lord transform our minds. So in closing, let me just give you three, three points of application with regards to framing, or should I say, reframing a situation. Here's the first one. Reframe a situation. Thank God for what did not happen. When was the last time you thanked God for something that did not happen? I know that takes some mental gymnastics, it, it, it becomes evident to me usually when I get in a traffic jam. I was traveling uh, down 40 uh, this week, took, took Wesley, his motorcycle. He's going to Fort Benning and rode in the mountains for a little bit. And, and then on the way back, I saw traffic jams. Now, let me just be confessional. I hate traffic jams. They, they actually can cause me to sin and say things I shouldn't say and think things I shouldn't think. And, 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 I feel very alone in this moment. Is anybody else with me? I see a lot of people, don't you judge me. Well, I'm, I'm seeing these traffic jams and, and then I, I, I got to the problem, what was causing the traffic jam, and it was a horrible accident. And because I'd been thinking about this message, the Holy Spirit smacked me upside the head and said, you about to talk about this? 
why don't you, instead of thinking bad things and getting all frustrated and huffing and puffing, why don't you stop for a moment and thank me that it wasn't you who got in the accident right up the road a little bit? Reframing a situation is thanking God for what did not happen. A story will illustrate a 21-year-old girl. She still lived at her home with her parents, and she was in a little community college, and she came home, and she said, Mom, Dad, I need to talk to you. And um, she said, Let's, I need y'all to sit down for this. I have some bad news. And so they sat down together, and she goes, I, I hate to let you know that a few months ago, I was out at a bar, and I met this guy, and we started drinking too much, and he invited me back to his place. And um, we went back to his place, and I hate to tell you this, but we messed around, and I'm pregnant. And um, he promises me that, that one day he might marry me, but he's got to get out of drug rehabilitation center, and once he gets out, he's going to try to get back in school or at least get a job and maybe have some money to marry me, but until then, I'm just going to move in with him. And she paused for just a moment. She goes, now, none of that really happened, but I got a D on my chemistry exam. <laughs> and I wanted to let you know that it could be a lot worse. <laughs> Y'all were all up in that story, man. <laughs> Seriously, see, sometimes, sometimes you need to just think, you, you think your kids are bad, and they might be, but have you ever stopped to thank God for what? has not happened, and it's just a chemistry exam. Oh, he said that, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Reframing a situation is thanking God for what did not happen. Secondly, preframe a situation. Preframe a situation. Here, here's what this means. Decide how you'll frame a situation before you engage in that particular situation. Decide how you'll frame a situation before you engage in that particular situation. Now, when this is very important is when you are about to engage in something that you don't want to engage in. Everybody here knows what that's like. Have you ever had an experience where you, you set an event or maybe you had a bunch of people, you invited a bunch of people over to your house and it sounded and it felt really good when you invited them. Oh, you with me? And then as Friday rolls around and they're arriving at six o'clock, you are like all hacked off and you're thinking, why did I invite these people over to my house? And you're trying to get out of your thing. Maybe I can tell them I'm sick or, or, you know, whatever the case may be. Maybe I can order some food out and then put it on my plates and act like I cooked it. Don't you do that. Um, but so, so to actually understand this concept is that I am going to frame it before I actually get into it. Because you have two choices in that moment. You can go into that event or that meeting at work or like I said, that dinner party and you can just be Mr. or Miss Miserable or you can pre-frame the situation before you step into it and you can change your mind. You can create new neural pathways to say, you know what? I might not be filling up for this right now, but these are some good people. And here's what I'm gonna do, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna ask that you infuse me with a positive attitude tonight and I'm gonna step into this situation and I'm gonna realize that these people love me and I'm gonna love them and I'm gonna thank you that we have a place to have a dinner party and we have food on the plate and I'm just gonna trust God that even though I'm not really feeling it in this moment, you're gonna speak to me tonight and you're gonna bless me and through me, you're gonna bless them. Instead of, again, going into the evening and having a miserable, miserable experience. Last thing, and we'll wrap this bad boy up. Post-frame a situation. 
post-frame a situation. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're gonna reframe a situation. We're gonna thank God for what did not happen. The second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pre-frame a situation. When we're going into a situation and we don't wanna go there, we think it's gonna be bad, we're gonna get our mind right, we're gonna take it obedient to Christ and we're gonna step into it as positive Holy Spirit-infused believers who bring energy into the room. And the third thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna post-frame a situation. We're gonna look for God's goodness during and after a situation. We're going to what? Look for God's goodness during and after a situation. Because I have news for you. There's goodness in every situation. That's a big, bold statement. But I have come to believe that is true. There is goodness in every situation. Even if the act is horrific and sinful and demonic as a Christian child of the most high God, if you look into a situation long enough and if you live within the midst of it, you can find goodness. I think of the difference between a vulture. Y'all know, y'all, y'all, y'all know, y'all see vultures? Nasty, nasty, ugly vultures, man. And here's what they do. They, they go and they, they, they live out their entire day looking for dead stuff, nasty stuff, decaying stuff. And guess what? They find it because there's a lot of nasty, dead, decaying stuff everywhere you go. But there's this other bird that I like. It's the hummingbird, the hummingbird. And the hummingbird, (laughs) y'all like that, didn't you? The hummingbird looks for sweet stuff. Where I'm from, my grandparents had it, my parents had it. We had hummingbird feeders around. And we'd put sweet sugar water in the hummingbird feeders. And the hummingbird, hummingbirds would come around and they'd be around all day long. And I just fell in love with the hummingbird. It's the juxtaposition of a vulture and a hummingbird. And I just want to tell you that if you're going to live out your day looking for bad stuff... If all you do is watch the news all the time, which by the way, wants to hook you on the bad stuff. If you're gonna live out your days looking for dead stuff, decaying stuff, stinky stuff, nasty stuff, you're gonna find it. By the way, in our victim culture, where everybody wants to be a victim, if you wake up and every day you're looking to be offended, like that's your ambition, even if it's even if even if it's in your subconscious psyche that you you live every day by being a victim and you want to be offended. If you get up and you look for that every day, I promise you, you will find it. But that is a miserable way to live. But if you wake up every day and you look for the goodness of God, you look for the sweet things in the world. Likewise, you will find it. And that is a beautiful way to live your life. It's all about mindset. Change your thinking, change your life. Now, I don't really know where you are today mentally. And it doesn't matter where you are. Like if you're, if you're like the hummingbird and you're good, man, praise God, welcome. If you're like the vulture and you're kind of a little sick and you're looking for sickness and darkness and defeat, and welcome. Like seriously, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. There's, there's not a better place for you to be. Because the truth is we all just live through a really hard time. And the collateral damage that tends to linger on us after a year like 2020 is real. And you're looking at a man who went to the brink of darkness. 
I don't expect you to understand, and I surely don't mean to make out like my situation is any worse than yours, because it's not. But 2020 was one of the most brutal years of my life. And I don't know if you can fully imagine it, maybe you can, maybe you can't, but you, you start a church in your home 20 years ago, and then you watch this invisible virus come in and sucker punch us all. And then you have to take a movement and we never shut it down, but I just wanna be honest with you. I didn't use that language back then, but I felt like we were shutting it down. And then we took the whole church and we moved it online. And in my circles, as, as I was talking to lots of pastors and friends in 2020, here's, here's where we lived, here's where I lived. Oh, how are we gonna get through this? Will the church ever recover? The times are so dark. What is Satan up to? I feel like he has a stronghold on the church. And, and it was just dark. And then on top of that, when, when we, we were very prudent and careful, then we decided to open up the church. November 1, remember? We back, remember that? We back. <laughs> I got up here and said that. We back. I felt like jumping off of the stage here and landing on my head. And then I walked out and then there's nobody here. <laughs> we back, all 12 of us, yay. <laughs> and the ones that are here have masks on. And, and so then start taking hits for those who accused us of going back too early. It was November. And if, if we went back, we were idiotic and anti-science and if we had stayed online exclusively, we had no faith, and it was a no-win situation. And then on top of that, we had all of the racial tension going on. Remember that? And y'all know how my heart is for that. And then on top of that, we had the whole mask thing going on. If you, if you put a mask on, you know, it was, people would assume you were just some flaming liberal, right? If you didn't put a mask on, you were some right-wing conservative, anti-science. And it was just, it was a no-win situation. And, and I lived down here thinking it was the worst year ever. Or was it? See, what, what I've actually come to believe in June 2021, <laughs> wish I could say I was up here back in 2020, but what I've come to realize in 2021, and God started to actually whisper it to me in late 2020, but that God is still moving and on his throne. And God is still a powerful God. And come on, church. And that God is still going to have his way. And then Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in what? All things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. And I started to kind of try to make my way up into the upper story and realize that I don't look at circumstances and judge the goodness of God. I put it like this in my notes. We don't interpret the goodness of God through our circumstances, but we interpret our circumstances through the goodness of God. And God has been moving throughout COVID. People have come to faith in Christ. People are getting baptized. God was doing what God wanted to do. Again, don't mishear me. I said this a lot in 2020. Don't blame COVID on God. But oh my Lord, God was redeeming it. And might I say, God was pruning his church. You see, the beautiful thing about what's happening now is that everybody who is here wants to be here. You're fired up about being here. And if you're still online, we'd love to have you come join us because God is doing a great work in his church. It's all about mindset. Change your thinking. Change your life. Let's pray together. Father, we love you today. 
And we ask that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would help us to reframe some things going on in our lives right now. God, we ask you to renew our mind, any area. Hey, if you're here right now and you need God to help you reframe some things, and that's probably about every single person here, would you do something bold at all of our campuses? Would you just raise your hand if you feel like you need God to help you reframe some thinking? Yeah, hand, that's what I thought. You can drop them down. God, help us to see you in the midst of our situation. Father, at all of our campuses right now, for everybody who just raised their hand, just say, God, help me. God, help me in my thinking. Help me reframe to see your goodness. Father, I thank you that you're working. And even as people are watching online, Father, you're drawing them to your church. You're renewing our minds with truth. You're teaching us how to think differently and you're changing our lives in the process. Father, thank you for this series and we ask that you would just move mightily in our day and in this week, God, that we would start applying what we're hearing, that we would demolish the strongholds that have been destroying us for too long. We would demolish the critical negative spirits that have permeated our minds all of these years and we would put on the mind of Christ. And we would take captive those negative thoughts. And we would ask, oh God, that you would transform us. Romans 12, 1 and 2, that you would transform and renew our minds. Father, I pray for the person who is here and they're still in the dark spots. I'm so glad they're here. And I know I'm praying right now and our eyes are closed, but I just want to say this to you. I want to speak this to you. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. God has you. And there is goodness in God and therefore there is goodness in you. You're going to be okay. Okay. And if you don't have the faith to believe it right now, borrow some of mine. And you will be able to declare in the old words of that hymn, it is well. It is well with my soul. Father, thank you for what you're doing in this church. Thank you that I get to love and serve these beautiful people. Transform our minds, we pray. Transform us today. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.